Well, I don't know if you're gonna clap for me <laughs> after I deal with the subject I'm dealing with, because um, Pastor Ryan wanted to continue in the series of, of sin, of poison, and he has assigned me the task of, of, of preaching and talking about the sin of envy. And uh, I was thinking uh, that this sermon is going to be compared to a flight that you take and you're gonna have a smooth takeoff and um, probably halfway through this sermon, you're probably gonna need to buckle up because we're probably gonna go through a little bit of turbulence and then hopefully we're going to have a smooth landing and uh, praying that you hear the heart of your, one of your pastors, me this morning, um, in dealing with the subject of envy. It's not easy, let me just tell you that. It's not easy, this is not going to be something that we, that you know, like, this is gonna be tough because everybody in this room has either experienced envy or jealousy in their life. Everyone in this room has, has had an issue or envy or does have it currently. And it has probably caused some hardship uh, in your life. I wanna just recap um, real quick. And I, I threw this luggage up here because I'm gonna use this at the end. Um, this is not a day trip for some of you. Like some of you pack uh, a day trip and you have like five pieces of luggage. Um, that's not what this is. Um, can I get an amen from the men? <laughs> just in a recap this morning, um, we're, talking about, uh, we're talking about the life that God wants you to have. We're talking about the kind of life that God wants you to have. And Ryan um, quoted a, an author and he says, he said, in sum, shalom or peace is God's design for creation and redemption. And sin is blamable human vandalism of these great realities and therefore an affront to their architect and builder. Our sin is vandalism to God's plan for us. I hope you picked up on that when Pastor Ryan shared that two weeks ago. He, he even says, and I quote him, he says, this is Ryan talking to this, to us. He says, I would say that sin is the poison that is at the heart of all our pain and dysfunction. Sin causes pain and dysfunction. And God does not want us to operate in pain and dysfunction. Amen? Come on, amen? amen? The world is not the way it's supposed to be. Humanity is broken. But God has a solution and his name is Jesus. Amen? So I've been given this assignment to talk about envy. And I've been like cramming. Uh, for three days on this. And uh, so let's, let's jump into this. And uh, I pray this morning, you hear my heart. I, I pray this morning that we leave here with a better understanding that God does not want us to operate in envy. And he doesn't want us to operate in jealousy. He ultimately wants to, for us to operate in kindness. And he ultimately wants us to celebrate each other and not be envious and jealousy operating in our lives. Can we pray? Can we just ask God's spirit real quick? Father, God, help us. God, help us see this. God, help us to respond to your Holy Spirit, God. God, and may you do some surgery today in our hearts. And everybody said amen. amen. Situations that I thought about, there are probably a thousand of situations that we can talk about envy or, or jealousy, but maybe how about this? A coworker gets a promotion that you're hoping to get and you feel angry and resentful, and you begin to harbor feelings of wanting him or her to fail. Maybe it's a classmate from high school or college that maybe, maybe pops up in a news feed, or maybe is a Facebook friend, or maybe you actually, they've risen to a place where they're celebrities and you see them on television. Um, you begin to think, well, uh, well gosh, they're doing quite well, or he's doing well, or she's doing well. And then you begin to compare yourself to them. And you may ask the question, like, where am I? 
and you start to compare yourself to them, then you begin thinking about, well, what an obnoxious person she was or is. And after you assassinate them by your words, you feel better in a few minutes. Or maybe you're at an event, you can fill in the blank. Maybe you're at a, a, a wedding, or maybe you're at your eating, or, or maybe you're at a neighborhood thing, maybe you're with family, whatever it may be. You fill in the blank, you're at an event, and someone of the same sex as you is outgoing. And they're, they're surrounded by people. And, 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 and they look, their looks, they're more attractive than you are. And you begin to feel depressed. And you think, I bet they're shallow. I bet they're so pretty, but they're shallow. Or someone uh, just bought a really nice house, or a really nice car, or, or, or they're on a trip. Or, or I've been thinking about lawnmowers lately. Maybe it's a new, new lawnmower. <laughs> Maybe it's a, a Toro 50Z, help me bear it, zero turn lawnmower that costs about $7,000. And you're like, man. And you instantly think this, man, I bet they're in so much debt How do they afford that? And you start, I didn't know they must make that much money. And you start with character assassination. If you find yourself familiar with this, envy is at the door. I saw, gosh, there were so many famous quotes about envy and resentment and jealousy. And you've, you're, you're probably familiar with, one, with this one. It says, resentment is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. Jealousy is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. Envy is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. The biblical definition of envy, there's, there's, this, is, this is real clear in scripture. The Greek word is, is translated like, I start, I start feeling ill-willed towards the person. There's the Greek word zealous that we get zeal from. And there can be a positive aspect to it and there can be a negative aspect to it. But the Greek word zeal or anger is, is like, it, it's translated as zeal or anger or boiling or, or it's, ferment, it's fermented being translated either as envy or, or jealousy. But it can also, it can also have, a, it can also be positive. Zealous can be very good, very good, and, and it can be very, very bad. Positively, it can mean zeal or eagerly desiring maybe a spiritual gift that God gives us as in 1 Corinthians 12, 31, or it can refer to a godly, a good jealousy. But zealous used negatively describes a sinking feeling in your stomach when being threatened. It can arise in someone from their not excelling while seeing another excel. It is a resentment that boils up inside of you when a friend or a rival succeeds or surpasses us or when we feel left out. It is the fear of being replaced. It is what we feel when being unfavorably compared to others. We can be jealous or envious of someone you have never met. You can be jealous of someone who is famous if they are brilliant, if they are beautiful, rich, or very happy. 
And I would say probably 90% of the time when we're talking about this, we're talking about envy. About 10% of, 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 of this connection to this is, is jealousy. The difference of jealousy and envy is this. Envy tends to focus on the other person's things. Jealousy, jealousy includes animosity towards that person. Envy is also con- coveting what others have. Now, I'm not going to address that necessarily today because that's part of the list of sins we're dealing with. But can I, can I just hit it real, real? Light? There is something about being content in what God has given you. He gives it. And he early tells us not to covet. Envy is, is natural and passive. Jealousy is vengeful and active. Jealousy is envy manifested. Envy is the thought. Jealousy is the obsession. When you are continually preoccupied with that thought. Jealousy is what spews out of the wicked comment or gives birth to the evil deed. Although it is a sin to envy, you can avoid needless trouble if you deal with it while it is, while it is only in your thought life. But when you allow it to govern you and dominate you, and then you express what you feel, whether by word or deed, you are getting yourself into trouble. It has to do with possessions. It has to do with successes. It has to do with virtues. It has to do with talent. So I was thinking like, where, where is the origin of, of envy? Where, where, where does it come from? Where, where do we get it from? The Bible makes it quite clear that it, it's early in the story of humanity. Matter of fact, we have a story that predates creation because Lucifer himself thought that he would take the throne of God from God. Isaiah 14, 13, 14, he says, this is Lucifer, this is the devil. This is what he said, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne against the stars of God. I will make myself like the most high God. From the beginning, the heart of envy was in, was in the being of Lucifer. Folks, that's early. Jesus says, some some say Jesus is mentioning him. He said, I saw Satan fall from like lightning from heaven because Lucifer wanted to be God. It's seen in some some biblical stories. You're familiar with them. I'm going to just touch, I'm going to touch three of them. We have the biblical account that records the narrative of of the story of Cain and Abel. We have Adam and Eve being created. We have Adam and Eve responding in disobedience in the garden. This is early. And they 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 get banished from the garden. And in that banishment, God still provides and God still covers, but Adam and Eve slide out of that, slide out of that relationship with God that they have. And, and, in, and in Genesis chapter four, we have this story of, of them having children. And in the process of having children, their children make a sacrifice to God. So somehow or another, they understand that they're supposed to sacrifice to God. Maybe they're taught that. Scholars, maybe some think that maybe Adam and Eve taught them how to do that. Text doesn't clarify it. But Genesis 4, 4, 1 through 5 says, the Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. And verse six says, then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, you will, will you not be accepted? 
But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at the door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Abel is presented by the writer of the, of the epistles of the Hebrews as the first man in, in, faith, in faith in human history. By faith, Abel offered a, a God a better sacrifice than Cain did. Cain's offering is not specifically criticized for its poor quality. The text, the text there does not imply first fruits applying here. We don't even have first fruits. We don't even have that yet. The text does not imply Cain failed or refused the first fruits offering. We don't know precisely about the offering, but we do know that in some way, Cain does not do what is right. The text is more interested in Cain's response to his offering. The emphasis is on the murder of Abel, not the unacceptable offering. And God will encourage Cain to do what is right. Cain has put himself in a position that sin is at the door, ready to jump on him. From the narrative, there's no report of Cain being tempted an understanding of what might happen to me if I act or a struggle of his conscience. This act of violence, of killing his brother, is fueled by bitter jealousy. It's the first, we have the first sins recorded in Genesis 3 that destroys the relationship that Adam and Eve have with God. It's the fall of humankind. And in chapter four, we have the fall of the family. We have a sin that destroys a family. And can I tell you this morning, envy will always destroy families. Amen. And we see the results of, the, of what the sin has on a family. And out of all the sin that is recorded, envy is displayed early. There is also revealed insight um, to Adam and Eve losing responsibility in the Garden of Eden. And Cain is not taking responsibility for his actions. Even though he is responsible for killing his brother. And when we refuse to take responsibility, we've paved a way for not taking the blame. Personal accountability disintegrates. And can I just encourage you this morning? Can we own some things? Yes, sir. Can we just be real this morning and own some things? Yes, can, we, can we own our, our, the, the things that are in our life that's causing us to not be in right relationship with God? Can we own this morning that somehow or another that through our actions uh, and, and it's our responsibility that somehow or another there's some personal accountability that we need to respond to? Can we do that this morning? Yes, it's interesting enough, I was reading about this, it's interesting enough that one author was saying that, that like, 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 like envy and jealousy Usually in, in the family setting, usually doesn't happen between like, like, like siblings and parents. It usually happens with brothers and brothers and brothers and sisters or sisters and sisters. Can I get an amen there? <laughs> I know a family that was so, there were three sisters. They were, they were so jealous of each other. The first sister, the first sister went to, uh, went to, um, went to Chapel Hill for her college education. The second sister was so eat up with jealousy and envy, she could not bring herself to go to Chapel Hill. She had to go to NC State. I thought I'd have got an amen from the Carolina crowd, but I didn't. <laughs> the third sister couldn't stand the, the first two sisters and she didn't go, to, she didn't go to, um, to Carolina or NC State. She went to East Carolina. I mean, think about that, just within the family. Eat up with jealousy and envy. My daddy didn't let me do that. Why do you get to do that? 
They let you go there, they didn't let me go there. They let you do this, but they didn't let me do that. Envy and jealousy destroys families. We have, we have some biblical account of that. Just a few chapters later, Joseph is going to get picked to be the favorite son and the brothers can't stand him. To the point they can't stand him, to the point where they, they wanna kill him. And someone has reasons actually in it and basically says, no, we can't do this. Let's sell him into slavery. And we'll lie about how he died. And the beautiful thing is, is that the Genesis begins with disobedience. So Adam and Eve walking in disobedience and this jack upness that happens in the, in the slippery slope of sin. And at the end of Genesis, you have this beautiful picture of a guy who actually wants to honor God by how he lives and how he responds to the things that comes in his life. Even at the root of it, Envy will cause you to say things and do things that you might not ordinarily do. It may even lead people to murder others. It did for Cain. And you can look at our culture, guys. I thought about this. We see the display, we see envy and jealousy displayed in blockbuster books and stories, TV shows, our movies, even in real life. It seems nightly on the news or in social media news feeds, we hear and see tragic story, stories about someone's life being taken because a fit of rage and of jealousy and envy, someone murders someone else. They take something They destroy somebody. When God confronts Cain about his offering, God is the one who recognizes Cain's anger and his downcast face. Can I tell you this morning that envy, envy always has a way of being seen in our countenance. Many people who walk in envy are sad. And it's hard, it's hard to hide it but it's there. And can I tell you this morning, if you're having the emotion of sadness and emptiness in your heart, the root of that might be envy. My God. Their sadness is carried, they not only carry it from the time they're little, they, some people carry it their whole lives and it's like baggage. But can I tell you the good news this morning? God does not want you to live that way. And God has given you a remedy to solve the problem of envy in your life. The life that God has called us to is reflected in the wisdom that we operate with. Proverbs picks this up. So does the book of James. The author of James is describing a kind of wisdom that is not of God. He's talking about it in James chapter three. He's talking about the tongue. He's talking about our words and how we say and what we do. Ron Ryder compares the lack of wisdom, this life of wisdom that James is talking about, compares it to a slippery slope of discord that can be manifested in a person's life. James is writing to warn against this very thing. There's a picture of evil in James 1.15 you have this concept of evil vices that, that begin, James begins to talk about, but he says these vices have their origin in desires that are earthly, unspiritual, or the devil, which leads to envy, selfish ambitions, which cause disorder. In James 3, 14 through 16, look at this. He said, this is James talking. He said, but if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambitions in your heart, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come from, the, from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy, selfish ambitions, there you find disorder and every evil practice. James is giving us practical wisdom on how you should live your life. 
God's wisdom should be manifested in your life and in your job and in your family and in your church. God's not called you to manifest envy or jealousy in those areas of your life. And not only, here's the turbulence, and not only is he addressing you as an individual, he is addressing the church. There should never ever be a biblical community that harbors selfish ambitions and practices envy. I'm talking about church. We are not called to be position seekers. God has not called us to, to seek glory. God has not called us as leaders to be arrogant and push our selfish ambitions. Biblical community is not about come see me, come hear me, come watch me. It should be about come see him, come hear him, come let's see what God is going to do. He alone gets the glory. I can tell you the, your pastor's heart and he can preach and he can preach great sermons but I know, I know Ryan Jackson, I've been working here nine years, and I know his heart, and I know that he would rather you leave, not that was a great sermon, but that you would leave and say, that is a great savior. It's not about what we do, it's about what God does. And we lay these selfish ambitions on the side. How do we do it? How do we get rid of it? How do you get rid of that in biblical community? You want to know how you get rid of it? You begin to celebrate others. You begin to celebrate each other. You begin to celebrate their gifts. You begin to celebrate them and their ministries. You, be, you, begin to, you begin to celebrate people that are in places of leadership in the church. I've seen it happen, man. I've seen envy and jealousy happen. I've seen it in my own life. In ministry, I used to look at all these other big, listen, man, I got an opportunity to sit in a room at Willow Creek Community Church in Chicago, and I sat in a room of the top 25 churches. I don't know how I got there. God got me there, and I'm sitting there with Joel Osteen, G's pastor, and Rick Warren, G's pastor, and I'm there with Paul Walker, and I'm there with Rick Warren's pastor, and I'm sitting there. They're the largest churches in America, and there I am at, at this little old, tiny little church in Goldsboro. These guys are at mega churches, and I'm sitting there like, gosh, man. Woo, it'd be great to be at those churches. Man, it'd be great. And I'm telling you, man, God checked me right there. And in that moment, God's like, Cuddy, you be faithful to the place that I called you. You let me worry about where I place others. And even in the church, we've seen the launching of assassination plans by sowing envy and jealousy. And it causes discord, words of resentment. And it may even be here at the Capitol Church. We want a church that loves, that encourages, we want a group of believers that celebrate each other's uniqueness, gifts, and talents, not compete. We're not here competing. We're on mission. We're on mission. God's not called us to operate in envy and jealousy of a positional places that God puts people in this church. God does that. We're not here competing with each other. We're on the same team, headed together and celebrating each other along the way. We're called to be and operate in the righteousness of God displayed in the context of how we live and how we operate in biblical community. It is in this place that we should never, ever sow a seed of envy or jealousy, ever. This is not the world. We're people of God. And we should be acting with compassion, mercy, abounding in love towards each other. We should be killing each other with kindness. Amen. That's true. 
called to celebrate each other. And our giftings, and let me tell you something, if you have a hard time celebrating others, then today begins the process in which God wants to change your heart. I remember, I remember we, we, as youth pastors, I, I ran into these five tests of, of giving emerging leaders. And, and so I, I instituted them like immediately. And one of the, the third tests that I, that I would give people to actually, I didn't, didn't let everybody on my team to serve in church with teenagers. I couldn't afford the wrong team member, especially in, in, in the assignment that I had. And one of, the, one of the tests that I would just give, um, if I had teenagers that wanted to kind of step up in leadership, I would just listen to how they talk. What are you talking about? Who, who do you talk about? Do you, do you have the tendency to talk about yourself? Talk about what you've done? You've really only been alive like 15 years. You haven't really done much, but you really want to talk a lot about it. And now listen, these, these, these guys, they're glory seekers. I want to be surrounded with a leadership team of glory givers. I want to surround myself, I mean, I was, I was like, I, gave, I would give it to adults. We'd go out and we'd go out to eat and they want to help us in youth ministry. We'd be ministering to 100 kids. We're, we're trying to minister to them and they want to jump on and help. And I would just listen to their conversation like, what are they talking about? Because if they're talking about themselves, uh-uh, you don't pass the test. I need adults that are going to honor people and give glory rightly. I want adults to be able to celebrate somebody else's win. A lot of that stuff is rooted in like selfish ambitions. It's also rooted in a poor self-esteem. I had a situation at a church I was working at and as pastors, I'm, I'm going to be really transparent with you this morning. If that's okay. Can I get an amen there? Um, I'm, 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 I'm going to be transparent. So as Lynn and I are, are youth pastoring, and then all of a sudden, you know, the ministry takes off and it starts growing. And, you know, it's like we tripled in like six months. And, you know, we're 7,500 kids. And, and you know, we're, we're going up for it with God and, and doing And then all of a sudden, I had, a, I had in my leadership team, all of a sudden I started noticing that there were people on my leadership team, there were couples that wanted like to keep us to themselves. And I'm like, we, were, we would talk about it and it was like, and, and what was happening is the couples that were serving on my team began to actually compete with each other of how much time we spent with them. And, it's, and, and you know what I'm talking about. You've got friends out there that are like, you're my friend and you cannot be anybody else's friend and I want you to stay right over here. Did, who did you talk to? I can't believe you talked to them. Can you believe he talked to them? I can't, I can't believe he talked to them. And it's like, and then, and then the thing is, they would talk to us about each other. Yeah, church. Jealousy amongst a staff. And when that stuff gets in there, it sows discord. And if it gets in your life, it'll sow discord. There's one last passage of scripture that I want to kind of hit, and I'm going to close this out. It's found in Proverbs 14.30. It's a heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. My God. My God. The author here is giving us a true picture of personal health. Proverbs is full of this theme. How do you want to live healthy? The contrast between a heart of peace that's literally translated, we talked about peace, shalom. Literally translated healing and envy where passion and jealousy meet is between that which promotes life and that which takes it away. The text focuses on the virtue of contentment. 
If you chase envy, if you are an envious person, if you are a person of, that's rooted in jealousy, ultimately it brings death. There are early Proverbs about one's heart. That's in Proverbs 14, 10, and uh, 13. That people of wisdom knew that jealousy and passion and envy eat from the inside out. Thus rotting the bones. And they got this picture of, of, of an apple fruit. They're going to throw up there. This is what envy does to you. It will rot you from the inside out. And I want to close with this. Many of you, maybe from the time you were little, maybe, maybe, maybe in your thinking, surrounded by people that somebody, somebody complimented on somebody and, and, and the person that may be a friend or, or relative or whatever, and, and all of a sudden, they, be, they began telling that person, well, she's pretty, she's beautiful, and, and you think that she's prettier than me. And what you do is you take that. You take that, and, and, and in the luggage of life that you're carrying, you take that thought, and you take that thinking, and you take that comment, and you put it in the core of who you are, and you, you, you think about it. Some of you in here, you've, you've, you, are, you are actually, uh, you are obsessed with envy on possessions. I got to have it. I got to have that car. I got to have that house. And you are, in, you are in pursuit in your life somehow or another. Maybe you grew up poor. I don't know. I, I, I was even going to talk about that. My parents grew up poor. Poor. They couldn't afford the R. They were poor. I'm telling you, they were poor. I mean, it's the joke that, you know, a guy's walking down the road and he's kicking the can and the guy says, what are you doing? And he says, moving. <laughs> they grew up, they grew up with the floorboards and the, they could see the dirt. My mom just recently told me the story. I don't mind telling you. She told me the story. They were so poor. They were so poor. And she tells me the story that when she was getting married, that she saw this dress that she really, 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 really loved. And she wanted that, but it was so much money, 150 bucks. She could not afford it. Two months before she got married, uh, she went to her dad and she said, I'm getting married. And he said, let's go. They worked in the field all day long, got in their car, drove to Wilson, got there right before the store closed. There was a guy that owned a, a store there and they walk in and she saw a dress and she couldn't afford the dress. And, and the guy said, well, you know, basically there's bride's dresses and, 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 and that are people that are wearing now. And, and here's one you might have. And, and she, she, she knew that her father didn't, my grandfather didn't have much money. And, and, um, and she said that, that she, she, she liked the dress and my, she saw my grandfather pull every bit of the money that he had in his wallet and the dress cost $20. And it was all he had. Poor. I can go now to either uh, Ale House or... or, or um, or a Chick-fil-A and get a salad that almost costs the same amount of what my mother bought a wedding dress for. And I can tell you when she told me that story, don't think that I don't think about that while I'm eating that salad. We are blessed, you are blessed. But somehow or another, you start comparing yourself to the Joneses. You start saying, I gotta keep up with them, and I gotta have that, and I gotta run after that, and I gotta, we, man, we gotta have that, and my kids have gotta have the night. Listen, I had a neighbor, and his mom bought him clothes. He wore it one time and gave it to my brother. And I'm sitting there, and I, that was back in the days of really like seriously hand-me-downs. So I would go in my brother's room, and I'd be like, oh my Lord, this one's coming my way. They have a nice car, and I gotta have it. 
I got to run after it. And you put this thing and you put it in there and you think about it and you're consumed with it and you're over the top with it and you're like, I got to have it. I got to have one just like it. And you're riddled with jealousy. Sports, dance, piano players. Maybe it's the shortstop on your, on your baseball team that you grew up with and, and all of a sudden it's, you know, everybody makes over him and he's the superstar and he's this and he's got so much talent and look at him, man, and he's like, everybody celebrates him and you're sitting there brooding because you want to play shortstop but you don't have the talent to, put, to play shortstop. We need you to play right field. So you sit out in right field and you think, gosh, man, it's like, wow, he's a better ball player than I am. He's a, she's a better piano player than I am. He, he's a better singer than I am. She can shoot basketball better than me. And you take that and you put that in your heart and you put that into your life and you sit there and your countenance is sad and you dwell on that. That's where you park yourself. She got the promotion, I didn't. She got the position that I deserve. And you are riddled with envy and jealousy. You can't celebrate that person because you're jealous. So what you do is you pick up your whole life and you surround your whole life with all these questions and all these things and thoughts and you try to live your life the way that you think you ought to live your life knowing that the core of who you are is that you're trying to get through life you're trying to get through life and you're trying to navigate how God designs you and you're walking and you're you're trying to get along and you're going through life all this baggage because of sin and God says, let it go, and you put it down, and then you pick it right back up, and you're like, no, I'm going to live my life. I'm going to pursue these things. I'm going after this. You don't have any kindness. You don't have any compassion. You don't have any mercy, and you're carrying all this baggage. Right. Got to have it. Got to run after it. Right. But the answer to your problem is the kindness of God. And he wants you to let that baggage go. He wants you to operate and experience this the kind of God that needs your gifts. The kindness of God in Romans 2 4. That leads you to a right relationship with God. It is the kindness of God. It's the fit fruit of the Spirit. Love. This is not easy. Because I'm preaching to me too. Quit running after it. Quit chasing it. And allow the kindness of God to do 
some work in your soul that is rotting from envy and jealousy. Why don't you bow your head? But when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, appeared, He saved us. Not because of righteous things we've done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Today is Pentecost Sunday. And there's no better Sunday than to allow the Holy Spirit of God to help deal with this issue in your life. Stop chasing envy, guys. Stop operating in jealousy. Let the Spirit of a holy God that changed nations in Acts 3 change your heart today. Father, this is not easy. And it never is when we're dealing with sin. But God, I pray today that you shine a spotlight in our hearts, God. We don't want to vandalize you, God. We don't want to vandalize your plan. God, we want peace, God. We want righteousness. We want the rightness of God. We don't want to walk in envy, God, or jealousy. We want to celebrate others, God. I wonder, is there anyone in this room that would be honest enough to lift your hand right where you are and say, Cuddy, I need help with this. I need God to help me with this. And you just lift that hand right there. Anybody across this room. I want you to lift your hand up really high. I want you, I want you to lift it up and hold it there. Anybody else? I'm talking to everybody in the house, guys. The tendency is to throw it off and say, ah, that's not me, that's not me. Yeah, it is. It's us. I got my hand up. I got my hand up. Anybody else? Now, will you do me a favor and lift your other hand? Can you lift your hand right now, both of them? And I want you to ask Jesus right now in your own words. I want you to pray right now. Say, Jesus, Jesus, God, I need your kindness. I need your goodness manifested in my life. Do it right now. I'm gonna pray. People of God, I want you to pray across this room for the people that have their hands up in the air. Can we do that? Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we lift this up to you, Lord. God, we proclaim this, God, over this sanctuary, God. God, over the people of God. Lord, we will no longer operate in dysfunctional and, and discord in community, God. We're gonna operate and we're gonna celebrate each other. God, we're not gonna walk in envy and jealousy, God. We're not gonna, God, we're gonna reflect the virtues of heaven. We're not gonna, we're not gonna, we're not gonna reflect the virtues of hell. We're gonna get heaven into our hearts. God, the Spirit of God, may it do a supernatural work in us, God. Lord, I pray that we will not chase possessions, God. God, we will not chase positions, God. But Lord, we will chase the person of Jesus Christ in our life and he will lift us up in due time and he will we will set a he will set our feet in our place in God into this community God into this community into, into this biblical community God into the community of this of this city God Lord I pray that this is this this example of walking in kindness and celebrating each other God will be manifested in the families God represented in this church God in Jesus mighty name Jesus' name, Lord, I pray that over us. God, may your kindness lead us to repentance, oh God, today. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, can we give the Lord a clap offering of praise? Amen. Come on, he's worthy, come on.
All tray tables need to be in the upright position as we land softly. Hear my heart, guys. Hear my heart. Do not let sin of envy rotten your life. Let go. Learn to celebrate others and allow the kindness of God to be manifested in your heart. Amen? Amen. I'm going to dismiss you. Thank you for being here this morning. Thank you guys that are watching online. Be blessed. Have a great week. And we will see you next week. God bless.